Uh, so, Luke, I have something to tell you. I am going to Bruges, en famille. Um, do you know where Bruges is, Luke? It's in Belgium. Yeah, well, we could easy, we should review the film in Bruges. While, I saw that recently. While I'm in Bruges. Um, oh, anyway, yeah. so I'm going to Bruges, and the only important thing is, because I'm there from Thursday until Sunday, so I will be back um, in time for the podcast. However, there is one thing I won't be back in time for, Luke, and that is the World Cup final. And this is a, this is a lesson about uh, a planning ahead. Planning ahead. It's not a lesson for me, really, uh, because I didn't organise when we would be going on the on the trip. Um, but and, and also assuming because my parents assumed that the World Cup final would be in the evening. Just it just felt like it that would naturally be when it was. Yeah. So therefore, uh, we're, we're planning. We're co- probably going to be coming back around six p.m. Uh, uh, in the evening, and. That is, of course, going to be uh, possibly after the final's over, depending on whether or not it goes to extra time. Uh, so the important thing is, Luke, that having watched every single World Cup match, the one match that I might not end up watching uh, could very well be the final where it comes home. That's hilarious. Which is, yes. Um, see, the thing is, what if we somehow manage to... Avoid. I think the original assumption was, or the original reason we didn't really care, because we found out we were going to be going away during the final a while ago, but we were assuming that it would just be some kind of, you know, Spain v. Netherlands or something, Even and we wouldn't Netherlands hear the result. In it. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I've watched every match, but I just imagined loads where Netherlands are playing. Yes. But anyway, yeah, we were imagining that we wouldn't hear, that, or the result wouldn't be that important, so we would, you know, get back, uh, maybe a bit late, but we, we, you know, we'd have a recording, we could just watch it, we could pretend we're watching it live. However... It's going to be England playing, and there's pretty much no way that uh, we're going to be on public transport the entire way back. Uh-huh. We're, we're going via train, and we're going to be on a train in England while England are playing in the World Cup final. Oh, I, mean, I assume. Maybe not. Um, so, quite interesting. But yeah, if, if in theory we did somehow manage to get back without hearing the result, then we would just pretend we're watching it live, even though we'd actually be watching a recording. Uh, the other small interesting detail is that if Belgium lose to France then Belgium will be playing in the third-place playoffs while we are in Bruges, and that would be nice. So I'm hoping Belgium lose to France. Well, uh, yeah. But what, what would be very awkward is if England lose to Croatia, and then it would be Belgium versus England in the third-place playoffs <laughs> while we're in Bruges. Why do you, why do the team that you support and I support and the team that another team that's in the semi-finals have to be in the semi-finals? It's all my fault. It's just so inconvenient, isn't it? I know. It's to be Okay, so Luke, maybe you can tell me whether or not this is true, because this is strict it's coming home news i kind of picked up just just from half paying attention to the the commentary as i do is it true to say that england has only been in the semi-final twice that is correct and it's also so that means we have a 50 percent chance of winning uh i mean yeah <laughs> and if we win the semi-final we have a 100 percent chance of winning because we've only been through to the final england once. have never been in a world cup final and lost Yes, exactly. So we've got 100... Exactly, that's why it's... See, I was thinking, like, that's why we're so excited. Because I bet yeah. people in France... People in France aren't going crazy. Even though they've, they've won just as many World Cups as us. For them, you know, winning a World Cup is, is just as much of a uh, unlikely thing. But the difference is that for them, it's like, well, you know, they get to uh, finals and um, semi-finals. Not, all the not time. always, but yeah, quite re- more, more regularly yeah. than England does. Yeah. Anyway. Also, so England, that... an England player has always scored a hat-trick in a World Cup final. So... It's got 100% it's, guaranteed to score a hat trick. It's coming home. Yes. Oh wow. That's. I mean, honestly, Luke, it does. It's. I think that's why. That's why everyone thinks it's coming home. I mean, that's why it is coming home. But it's also why everyone thinks it's coming home because because it's so rare for us to get this far. And it is just yeah. It's very annoying because it's going to come home. Ironically, while we ourselves, my, me and my I'm family, are coming. Yes. Are, are, well, coming home. We will be coming home as as football is coming home. We will be uh, traveling alongside football you, on the way home. It's like poetry. It rhymes. Back up, chump, you know Biggie Smalls rips it quick It kicks it quick, you know how black niggas get With the hoods for keys, with the boots with trees All the people with the keys, make it crazy, keys Hitting buck shots at niggas that open spots for the avenue Take my loot and I'm bagging <laughs> Pippin' hoes that drive bobos and rodeos Flash the roll, make a wet in their pantyhose Damn, a nigga style is a North Adopt script the clock When I walk down the crowded blocks just in case a nigga wanna act out, I just black out, blow the motherfucking back out. That's a real nigga for you.
Mm-hmm. Hello and welcome to Select and Reflect, the movie review podcast where we look at films that come out relatively recently at the cinema. Uh, I am your host, Michael, and I'm joined as always by my co-host, Luke. And this week, we are celebrating the, uh, it's got to be, 30th anniversary of Die Hard? Yep. And Luke, why don't you tell us a little bit about the 30th anniversary? So yes, uh, basically this movie came out on the... 12th of July 1988 in Los Angeles, and July the 15th, 1988 in the United States, although obviously it's set at Christmas. So that is almost 30 years ago to the day uh, that we'll be doing this review, uh, or this movie came out, and obviously we'll be doing this review because of that, uh, depending on when it comes out, who knows. Um, yeah. But yeah, well, maybe it'll come out on the exact date. Well, actually, yeah, it's going to be different. I see, the thing is, because I'm going to be in Bruges... Um... I, I I might actually try and upload it early and then just just leave it up early. Oh, wow, what a treat! Rather uh, than uploading it late. Yes. So Die Hard, just to give a summary of it, it's a 1988 American action film directed by John Tiernan and written by Stephen E. D'Souza and Jeb Stewart. Um, it follows the off-duty New York City Police Department officer John Clayne, who's caught in a Los Angeles skyscraper during a Christmas Eve heist led by Hans Gruber. And it's based on Road Thick Thorpe, Ro- no, Roderick Thorpe, there we go, Roderick Thorpe's 1979 novel, Nothing Lasts Forever. Uh, so there you go. Uh, it's based on a novel, which I did not know before, looking at this Wikipedia page uh, just a, about an hour ago. So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, stars Bruce Willis, Alan Rickman, Alexander Gudrunov, and Bonnie Bedelia. And there's probably more people, but that's all they're listed. Uh, and do you want to have a guess at the budget, Michael? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I struggle. I struggle with with all this. Is it inflation adjusted, Luke? Uh, no, I, I okay. very much doubt it. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be a couple of shillings. The eighties was a long time ago. Uh, I'm just going to go for for forty million. Twenty-eight million. Okay. Mm, okay. Only 28 million. Still uh, quite a decent amount for the 80s, like as you say. Things have moved on quite a bit since then. Yeah. Uh, and now the box office. Um, you see, well, here's my question for you, Luke, before I answer your question. Can you name any other film that came out in 1988? Rain Man. There we go. Okay, good. Uh, that's... <laughs> see, I, I, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of when films come out, but I think I could name a film that came out in most other years of the 80s, but... Uh, 88, I was thinking to myself, I can't think of any other films that came out in 88, but yeah, Rain Man. Um, I'm gonna go for 160 million. 140 million. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah, obviously Rain Man came out the same year. That grossed, I think, like 330 million or something around that. And obviously Die Hard has had much greater success post release than Rain Man, so that's, that's very interesting. Yeah, uh, Rain Man had a lot of franchise potential too. Yeah, it did. It did. <laughs> Tom Cruise finds another autistic brother. <laughs> uh, It'll be like Daddy's Home too. <laughs> like it's like he finds the brother's brother or his dad's brother. That's how you do it. Yeah. They could have had Rain Man. Rain Man ended a teaser <laughs> where like some other autistic family member shows up. And it's like, oh no, here we go again. Pure comedy. Yeah. Uh, so Michael, did you like? Die Hard. I l- liked. It. I was trying to say like I. I they, I. they should call this film Like Hard because it was hard for me to like it. No, no, because I liked it. I liked it hard. You liked it hard, yeah. I, I liked it hard. Uh, I. I pressed on that like button. I liked. I liked it like like our viewers are gonna like this video. Yeah, actually, you know what? Talking to our viewers, Michael. Just a. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody put on the recent Sicario video. I thought that was you. No, that wasn't me. No. Uh, you know what? I mean, that that is that. This is bizarre because it's almost like, and I know for most people who have a YouTube channel, this is like a normal thing. But for for me, I feel kind of violated that somebody who isn't either of us is watching our videos. No, I got excited. I was like, we, we upload we upload these for us. <laughs> oh shit! Somebody's actually watching and actually paying attention. <laughs> so so whoever that person was, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, the audio great. did cut out on 23 minutes, but I hope those 23 minutes were good. Yeah. And we have re-uploaded that video, if you are listening. That is crazy, yeah. yeah. I mean, wow. Like, they, they are they are just a, 
a truly special person. When we become famous, we'll dedicate something to them in a speech. We should invite them onto the show. We should. All, we, they they should be able to do requests. If if you're listening, write in the comment section what film you would like us to review. Oh, incredible! So uh, yeah, <laughs> so we do have actually. Well, we actually do have people or one person at least apart from us do who listens yeah. to this but i don't think they i don't think they smash that like button hard enough no you need so you need. In, in dedication of like hard the new film like hard i recommend that you like smash that like button hard yeah, yeah. hard uh okay so yeah i also liked this movie uh, as well i also liked die hard uh, obviously i've seen it a number of times so yeah my opinion didn't really change uh so do you have any nitpicks uh, I have one, and I, I was reaching for it, to be honest. Well, um, I don't know how much I was reaching for it. Uh, I was kind of reaching for it. Uh, well, I have... I don't have nitpicks, I just have things that I liked, and I didn't know where else I could say. So the, op- the opposite to nitpicks. Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Uh, well, I guess seeing as I'm the only one who has nitpicks, I'm going to say it, but yeah, you're not really allowed to, to criticise it, because it was the only one I could, could come up with. Um, so... It, towards the beginning of the film, one of the main tensions is that Bruce Willis is trying to alert the police to his presence. Yes. And obviously that um, that quickly becomes kind of like not an issue. But uh, he's being shot from uh, on, on the rooftop. Yeah, there, there's some people chasing him. They're shooting at him on a rooftop while he's like trying to contact the police to be like, "Hey guys, um, you know, come come rescue me or something." I don't know. I can't remember exactly. Uh, what yeah. But the thing is, I was thinking to myself, so. My my understanding is gunshots travel like quite far, uh, noise wise, and I'm pretty sure that there would be people within earshot of that building who would be able to hear the gunshots, and they would be you know phoning the police like, hey, I heard gunshots. Yeah, uh, that was, that's, that's the thing. I'm pretty pick. sure people would hear gunshots, and I'm pretty sure that that woman who was answering John McLean's like emergency distress call, she said this is for emergencies only, and so I don't know why she didn't take that. Obviously, what he's describing is an emergency, so I don't know why she said this is for emergencies only. Like, yeah, either you believe I, I, him or you don't. But I'm surprised she didn't take that more seriously. Wait, did, did John McClane say they've cut the telephone lines or not? Uh, no, they cut the telephone lines. Uh... Yeah, but did he say that? To the oh, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know. More importantly, though, you've reminded me of that, of that episode of The Simpsons where um, it's like uh, Bart's elephant breaks free and Chief Wiggum's answering like emergency calls and he's like, yeah, sure. An elephant just trampled your uh, your garden. Yeah, sure. An elephant just knocked your car over. Yeah, right. Mur- uh, two two gunshots, officer down. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it was kind of like Classic. that, I guess. Uh, so yes, I mean, I, I, yeah, that's it. That's all I've got for nitpicks. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you why don't you list your 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 list of things you liked? Okay, so uh, there's got to be a word for for the opposite to nitpicks. Yeah. What about lit lit picks? Lit. They're your your picks of things that were lit. That's right, my lit picks. So we've got the when when John McClane says that's a cute toy to that touch screen. I really like that. I don't know why it was just like this is this is thirty years ago and he's just been so dismissive of this technology and now everybody has it. Just, yeah. just a great way to date date yourself. And then the other bit, which I really, really like, is when the uh, the terrorists, or they're not terrorists, are they? The, uh, the robbers are uh, first walking into the building through the entrance, and the black guy, with the uh, yes, with the Afro, I like that too. I, I noted that down. Is uh, saying magic to Kareem to Worthy, back to Kareem, who. Puts it in for two, and I was like, "Oh, that's that's just great." It's a reference to the Showtime Lakers of the 1980s, and it was actually obviously the Showtime Lakers were going on, like that was happening at that point. Like it wasn't a reference; they were really good in the in the 1988 season. And so I was I was just like, "Oh, that's that's really cool that they you know put that in because it's I guess you could say it dates the movie, but it's just because obviously the movie's set in Los Angeles and the Showtime yeah. Lakers were a big part of Los Angeles culture in the 1980s." It's very nice to, to see that in there. Yeah, so I just, I mean, I liked it, but not for uh, not for basketball reasons, but just because I liked um, I liked the the tone it set of like kind of uh, it, it made them seem more evil because it was like they didn't even acknowledge the the significance of killing someone, like that the killing someone was just kind of brushed off, which I thought was cool tonally. Mm. That's why I liked it. Okay, yeah, that that too, but yeah. 
but yeah, but your, your nerdy basketball reasons. The too. thing is, what he was describing was a fast break as well, and that's what the Showtime Lakers were known for, like getting the ball out and pushing mm-hmm. it in transition. Um, yeah, to be honest, Luke, the only name I recognised was Magic. We've not heard of is Magic Johnson the guy who got HIV? <laughs> That's what he's known for now. Yeah, yeah, he's got HIV. He also is now the president of basketball operations for the Los Angeles Lakers, and oh. he recently secured the signature of LeBron James to join the Lakers just about a week ago. LeBron James. LeBron James. Yeah, which I was very excited about. It was actually a literally like, uh, yeah, a week ago exactly. Mm-hmm. Did, did LeBron James used to play for the Golden State Warriors? No, he, 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 LeBron James has oh. played the Golden State Warriors for four NBA Finals in a row. Okay. So he's definitely not I, played for them. He's played against them. I just see. I, I know we've had conversations about basketball before, and I I thought that was who's the guy who plays for the Golden State Warriors? Well, Kevin Durant does. Steph um, Curry does. I might be thinking. What who's Kobe play for? Well, he's retired now. Did he used to play for? He used to play for the Lakers. Oh, you know what, Luke? I just give up. Yeah, I mean, it's not that hard to, to be honest, Michael. But yeah, I mean, it's it's quite it's quite hard when you when you've never watched a game of basketball before, and also you don't take on board things that you're told. Yeah, those are two issues. So anyway, let's get into the old plot. Uh, so yeah, I basically destri- described um, Die Hard before because I had to read the uh, a bit of the plot before I said it's based on a novel. Uh, all about a NYPD officer, John McClane, who is caught in a Los Angeles skyscraper during a Christmas Eve heist led by Hans Gruber. Uh, basically, they, uh, Hans Gruber, a member of a West German socialist communist group or whatever, but he's expelled and everybody thinks he's a terrorist or he's not. He's just there to rob uh, the Nakatomi building, I think that's what it's called, uh, for $600 million or something like that. And John McClane's there to stop him. And John McClane's there because his wife Holly works in Los Angeles, and obviously they have an estranged, uh, yeah, estranged relationship. Uh, and the movie ends by him saving his wife from death and killing Hans Gruber, and you know everybody everybody wins at the end. So it's a happy yeah, uh, beautiful yeah, and obviously a lot of stuff goes down in between those two in points. Twixt. Yeah. Um. So obviously Michael. Uh, this movie is a very famous movie, and I think the plot for me was just here's, here's the thing: like it's not complicated, obviously, but it's just it's simple, and it just works so well. Uh, I think like the rewatchability of Die Hard is extremely like high. Uh, how about you? Uh, yeah, well, there are two other films that take place in a building um, entirely. One of which is, of course, the 2012 Indonesian film The Raid Redemption, and the other one is the 2013 superhero film Dread, and both of them involve uh, people in in buildings, in high-rise buildings that get hijacked by criminals, and then they have to fight their way out floor to floor, guerrilla style. Actually, and actually, Michael, do you know the... one more other movie which is set in a skyscraper? Uh, no, but tell skyscraper, me. Skyscraper, starring Dwayne okay. the Rock Johnson. I was, I, you know, I was going to guess that the film would literally be called Skyscraper. I was going to guess like High Rise. Actually, that movie's coming out right now, or certainly recently, and so maybe, maybe they're doing it, releasing it now because it's been thirty years since Die Hard. I, I don't know what the movie's about, but I know Dwayne the Rock Johnson. Or, or maybe they're doing it because it's been uh, five years since the film Dread. Yeah, maybe. Um, and they want that one to live off that capital. Uh, but anyway, yeah, and all three of those films have come are really good, and also that they're really re- rewatchable. I mean, so clearly you know there's Skyscraper something about. Good? No, sorry, I, I'm talking about three films. That oh, sorry, the three right, films: yeah. uh, Die Hard, Dread, and The Raid Redemption. I do not know whether or not Skyscraper will be good, <laughs> uh, but seeing as it is set in a uh, skyscraper and presumably it's an action film, yes, it's probably going to be good. I saw. So it's just something about watching people fight in buildings. Yeah, I saw the trailer and like. Dwayne Johnson's daughter is being held captive by the terrorists, and she's like really scared. And he's just like, "Don't worry, I'm gonna get you out of here," or something like that. Uh, While he's is he a good is he still like Taken? Sorry, is it like Taken? Uh, I have no idea. I don't think wow. it's gonna be that good though. Yes, I don't think it's gonna be good either. Because name one good film Dwayne Johnson's been in. Mm, mm, good point. Uh, no, I just we we could say actually we're doing Die Hard because of the release of Skyscraper. 
Yeah, we could actually. But why would we say that when we? That's probably not as much of a, a draw as a. Maybe you know what I'll do. I'll put skyscraper in the uh, in in the tags that I put. Ah. Because then then you know maybe I'll just put everything in the tags. Yeah. Maybe I'll put Star Wars in the tags, and people will be like, "Oh, the tooth fairy." That's something to do with Star Wars. Yeah. It's Christmas. Yeah. Christmas. Uh. Anyway, yeah, uh, I think I think so. I think I've responded to your your claim sufficiently that the fact that it is so simple that it's we're in a building, the building's been taken over by the baddies. We've got to fight our way down the building. Uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a great setup for a plot. Every film I think mm-hmm. should be should. It's, it's kind of like a video game when you think about it. like a video game is like you got to fight from level to level, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It, yes, but it's quite comparable. Uh, obviously. This is more than just a dumb action movie, and the thing is, like, even well, I, I think this movie's got a lot going for it in terms of characters and detail. And obviously, if it didn't have that, I, I won't say it's sorry. What you were gonna say? I didn't say anything. Oh, right. I think I think you. I think it's a ghost. Oh my god, it's a ghost. Oh no. Uh, so this movie has a lot going for it, uh, just regardless of the detail. Um, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. But basically, yeah, if it didn't have like the good, good characters and detail, I won't call it a dumb action movie. But because I think it's really well done, the everything makes sense in it. Um, the characters don't do confusing things. But I think the, the fact that it's a novelization, or sorry, this movie was a novel and then it became a film, uh, it makes sense because there are a lot of of things. Obviously, if you watch closely enough, that you're like, oh, that's interesting. And, uh, I'm glad they added that in. Like, if they were just doing like a Hollywood action movie today, like they wouldn't bother with putting this little line into that explains something, or having this character who's got this kind of personality, because you know they just they just don't care because that that's not what I think people remember about Die Hard. But I watching it back, I was surprised actually at how like detailed it was. And like for example, the uh, two of the uh, terrorists are brothers, like Hans and. Clark. Oh yeah, because one of them wants to to avenge the yeah. other. Yeah. Um. Or it wasn't Carl. Um. Sorry, it was Carl, but I don't know the other name of the brother. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I mean, to be honest, uh, no. I, I. So I. I've got something that if we go into the action after this, it could help me because uh because I've got something related that's to do with action. Oh, well, we're going to talk about characters after this. Oh, fine. <laughs> just just put a put a uh, an old post-it note there. Yeah. Don't let me forget, Luke. So, obviously, uh, the brothers, that's a nice little, you know, detail that... I, I don't think if somebody was just writing this, like, normally, and it wasn't a book, like a, a script, then they wouldn't have really thought about that. Uh, they, obviously, you have to make the, the book compelling, because you can't actually see the action right in front of you. So, I think, you know, the brothers and the fact that... Um, the wife, John McClane, what she called Holly, that's it, she... Uh, she puts up with, um, oh, she changes her last name to Gennaro because of, wait, the Japanese, uh, think that married women probably aren't as good at working or something. I think she refers to something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, she, she makes a comment like, oh, I want this private bathroom as well. Like when, uh, her and, uh, John McLean are in the bathroom at the beginning of the movie. Like, just little details like that. You just make it, makes it like, oh, you know what, this, this is more than just an action movie. This is enjoyable. Uh, and, yeah, I think you can tell that it was a book beforehand. Yes, I agree. Uh, you, yeah. Although, to be honest, I wonder, like, um, it must be a short book. Because uh, if the entire book... Like, imagine writing a, a, say, you know, if you say a standard book, it's like 300 pages. Imagine writing 300 pages just set in a skyscraper. Yeah. I think it would be impossible. <laughs> it would be impossible. Uh, so yeah, also the, uh, the character of, well actually, do you know what, Michael, we'll just get into the characters now. Because I think we've yeah, that's good. exhausted. Yeah, I mean, like you say, the plot is very simple, so. Yeah, uh... terrorists want to steal money, John McClane's got to stop them. And that's, that's the great thing about this movie. You can just literally explain the p- plot with one line. Uh, and I guess maybe that's what makes it rewatchable. Or maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a correlation between explaining the plot simply and rewatchability. Like if you can explain something in one line, then it means you're more likely to enjoy watching it over and over again. I'm not sure. Well, you know what they say, Luke? Uh, a very important method in novel writing is called the snowflake method, where the first step is to explain your entire story in one line. Then you have to explain your entire story in one paragraph. And then you have to explain your entire story in one page. 
And the idea is that eventually you branch out to, to create a synopsis that starts with a simple premise but gets increasingly more in-depth. Well, that's, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I used it one time when I tried to write a book, that, uh, a novel, which, which was great, Luke, but I never finished it. So hmm. I, I did do all of those steps. I do have a one-page synopsis for a novel, though, Luke, so oh. turns out that's not all it well, takes. Maybe you can do an audio reading of it yeah. put it on this channel. Good, good stuff. Luke. <laughs> uh, anyway, so now, 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 uh, now characters. Um, yes. Well, I, which one do you want to start with, Luke? Well, what could it? Which one could it possibly be? Uh, I think we should start with Bruce Willis. Yes, as John. Bruce yeah. Willis, John McClane. Um, it's it's easier to think of him as John McClane rather than Bruce Willis in this because in my mind, like John McClane has hair, Bruce Willis doesn't. Yeah. Even though there have been several subsequent Die Hard films where John McClane does in fact uh, not have hair. In my in my mind, John McClane has hair and Bruce Willis doesn't, and therefore I view them as two different people. Have you seen uh, the two recent Die Hard movies? Uh, okay, so which is the one where he <laughs> flies a motorbike into a helicopter? Fuck. I think... I, I don't know. I think that, that must be Die Hard 5. Yeah, I don't know how many there have been, because I feel Pretty like sure I've seen... Fun. um. Yeah, so I feel like I've seen at least one of the recent ones. Um, and then there's like a thing where they're in like a... Uh, oh, there we go. There's the sirens. Um, there's one where it's like they're in a, a multi-story car park and the car park is, is like collapsing level by level. I don't know. So I, I remember this one thing where it's like they're falling, but they're on this massive... Or it's a bridge. Uh -huh. Could be a bridge. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Luke, I've definitely seen... Um, which, one, wait, which one's the one where it's very much focused on his relationship with his daughter? With his daughter? Yeah. One of those. I, I mean, Die Hard 5 was on his relationship with his son. No, oh, so I feel like they just change it each time. All right, I'm going to look this up. Uh, die Hard Daughter. It is, in fact, uh, Live Free or Die Hard. So I've seen that one. Which one was um, that? <laughs> that was... Dun, 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 uh... It was, in fact, Luke, uh, the fourth installment. So, you know, what? I do think I've actually seen all five then. Oh, sorry, four and five. The funny thing is, I don't think I've seen three. I don't. So I don't think I've seen five Die Hard films, but I think I have seen the two most recent. Oh, wait, hold on a minute. What about the Die Hard arcade video game? Yeah, I haven't played that. It was, it's also called, what's it called? It's also called Dynamite Decker. What a great name. Yeah, so I think I remember the start of Die Hard 4, actually. Uh, John McClane's in a van, and uh, her, his daughter, uh, and her boyfriend are like making out, and like I don't know, he just stops them, and it's like very weird. <laughs> I was like, okay, this is what John McClane's doing now. How uh, how sad. Yeah. Uh, but Die I'm pretty sure Die Hard Five is about his uh, his son, like that his son and him go to Russia, or his son is in Russia and he's there to help. And it's just like it's it's awful, basically, Mike. It's just an awful movie. That's what I remember it uh, remember it being. I am very much inclined to believe yeah. you, Luke. Die, um, Die Hard Two, I didn't like. It's kind of more of the same as this Die Hard, just like worse. But Die Hard Three, Die Hard with the Vengeance, uh, I actually really like. I think that might be the only one I haven't I actually, seen. So that's yeah, just great. It's, it's like it's not as highly rated as Die Hard Two or the first Die Hard, but I actually do really like it. And I'm sure you'd like it as well. Stars uh, Jeremy Irons is the bad guy. Uh, oh, Jeremy Irons. Yeah, I mean, I I really like that movie. But yeah, uh, on to the cast anyway. Bruce Willis is John McClane. Streetwise New York cop who has come to Los Angeles to reconcile with his wife. The thing is, obviously in this movie, John McClane goes through an arc. Uh, yeah. He realises how important his wife is. And then in the next movie, and the movie after, and four or five, he's still separated from her. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, again, it's a case of the sequels ruining a movie which was really good. You would imagine, like, if John McClane would have moved to Los Angeles after this and been like, right, my wife and kids are important to me. I can just, why can't he just become a cop in LA? Why is that so difficult for him? Uh, and then, you know, he can live out the rest of his life happily. Uh, but obviously that did not happen. Um, Anything you got? Anything to say on John McClane? Um, not not really, because I guess he is kind of a uh, a bit of a 
co- cookie cutter superhero with his I mean not superhero but action hero uh which is kind of I suppose the point yeah uh, so yeah I don't I don't think um yeah I don't, I don't think he's interesting but I wouldn't hold that against the film yeah he's uh yeah he's basically he's an action hero isn't he like Hans Gruber makes reference to it or who are you you you're one of those Americans who's watched too many cowboy films or whatever uh, Yippee Kay, motherfucker. Yeah, <laughs> but obviously, I mean, he's he's a New York cop, so I'm, I don't know how how skillful he should be, or whether he should be able to pull off some of the stuff he does. But yeah, very streetwise, and yeah, just your your standard action hero who's got charisma as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, like Rambo. Like Rambo, <laughs> when he cries like a baby during. Rambo First Blood. Mm-hmm. I hope they do another Rambo film, then we can review Rambo. Maybe we can. Um, next up, we have Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, a German mastermind and leader of the terrorists. Uh, hilarious. You... Just so funny. Wait, what? Because cause he's, from, he's from Harry Potter. Oh, and yes, yes. Isn't that, isn't that just funny that um, he's, also, uh, he's also in a um, oh, what's her name? What's her name? The person who does Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen. Yes, he's also he's in a he's in a Jane Austen adaptation, and it's really bizarre because he plays like the romantic interest, but he's like you know I'm really in love with you. Rah. Yeah, it doesn't seem like that kind of. Person. No. Uh, I believe this was his first ever movie, Alan Rickman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he doesn't sound German actually. I want to say that he sounds just like a British person to me. Really. Well, okay, so he sounds like... Uh, I actually think, if anything, he sounded kind of inconsistent. Sometimes I thought he sounded German, like slightly German, but I thought he sounded um, quite quite uh, British a lot of the time. Um, ah. I forgot. I just forgot that Alan Rickman died. I just looked him up and I'm like, oh, wait, death. Huh. Crazy. Uh, this wasn't his first film, Luke, you liar. He was in... Oh, wait, actually, it might have been his first film because it's a television. Yeah. Yeah. This th- he played... His first his first appearance in anything was in an adaptation of Shakespeare. Die Hard was Romeo and Juliet. Die Hard was Alan Rickman's first feature role. And here's an interesting fact. For the death scene, he was dropped seventy feet on a green screen set. The shot used was the first take. Now, hold on a minute, that can't be his he didn't uh, didn't didn't he get die when he got shot by that black cop? Wait what? Or am I thinking of the wrong okay, so I might be thinking of the wrong person. You are thinking of the uh, right person, yeah. Okay, yeah, okay, yeah. I was see, see you know, that was just me, me not being able to remember. Have you gone see that? In in my head, I imagined Alan Rickman surviving, running outside, <laughs> and then getting shot by the who is it? Who does get shot by him? One of the blonde German. One of the ge- generic bad guys. Yeah. No, okay, he's not yeah. generic. He's I the could... guy McLean. Oh, oh yeah, I remember. Who, he's the guy who gets hung from the thing. Yeah. Yeah, and then and then he survives. That makes sense. Yeah. And of course, yeah, Alan Rickman does not in fact survive a. 70 meter drop yes uh well basically the shot that was used was the first take so alan rickman was dropped sooner than he had been told he would be so oh, i think i've heard so that the look of fear on his face was genuine uh the dvd text commentary track reveals that the shooting script did not originally include the meeting between mclean and gruber pretending to be a hostage it was only written in when it was discovered rickman could perform a convincing american accent and that's the thing like when you're Alan Rickman acting that scene, you're yeah. you're basically you're you're trying to be German, but trying to be German, trying to do an American accent. Yes, what uh, a thing to try and pull off. I I think I could do it. Okay, so the first, you start off with if you have ways of making, then you go, "Howdy, cowboy! It's good to see you." <laughs> that sounds that sounds like that sound just Nick. like a. Hi everybody, <laughs> I am a hostage. Like that's the thing, his accent didn't sound that convincing. He didn't sound that no. American. And I was like, it was only discovered Rickman could perform a convincing American accent. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't think sure, I was that yeah. convincing. Well, uh, I mean, um, like it, it didn't sound like Alan. It didn't sound like Alan Rickman, which is a good thing. It didn't sound like an American, but it also didn't sound that much. It sounded convincingly not like Alan Rickman, especially counting for the fact that he would have only heard him over the uh, what's it called? What's what's the walkie-talkie? Yes, yes, uh, I guess. Good stuff. Yeah. Um. So I just want to say that I think. We, well, we've said this before. We said this recently, actually, uh, when it was concerning superhero movies. The uh, a superhero movie, how good it is, is often there's often a correlation between how good the villain is as well. Obviously, mm. Dark Knight, and 
Joe Burr and all that. Uh, and this, in this movie, I don't think it's necessarily that true for action movies, but maybe it is. I, I'm not as well versed in action movies as I am in superhero movies. But obviously Hans Gruber is one of probably the greatest movie villains, you'd say, of all time. He, he Alan Rickman, you know, brings this like swagger to uh, to Hans Gruber. He just looks yeah. like he's, he's described as a German mastermind. And I don't think he he doesn't really do anything that smart, but he just looks the part. Like I'm, I'm not sure he does anything like crazy clever. Like he's well prepared and everything, but that doesn't necessarily make you a mastermind. I guess it's just his appearance and like the way he, he carries himself. Uh, he's just a really formidable villain who I guess you would be scared of uh, if you were well, uh, a hostage. I guess you'd be scared of him anyway. But yeah, certainly uh, he's a. I think he's a great villain. Would you agree? Uh yeah, uh I I agree he's he's a he's he's again quite typical as a villain in that it's like uh the I mean Alan Rickman in general is uh typical as a villain whenever I say Alan Rickman I always think of Adam Richmond from Man V Food. Do you think it's Anyways. typical though of a villain? Well okay so I think of like a uh, Scar. I think okay so it's kind of like the the low register um. Yeah, but at, at voice and well, okay. What do you think is is especially unique about him? Well, I'd say the difference of the scar is that uh, I I think I think scar's kind of like a uh, bitter. Like I mean, maybe that maybe that's just the difference between him and and Hans Gruber when it comes to their situations. But there's not actually anything different in their personalities. But I yeah I, I don't know I I think I kind of get the feeling like he was like one of the first like villains to be like this and afterwards there was a lot of like attempts to copy him like the well dressed villain who's very smart very prepared you know I, yeah. I, I don't know like I I'd have to go back and have a look at other action movies but I just, I just feel like he was he's just like the perfect villain to be in one of these movies yeah uh, I mean I'm maybe you're right maybe there isn't that. Anything well, it's not anything in particular, in particular that's special about him. Uh, but he just, yeah, he seems like really clever. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, he, he I guess, for example, he's not, uh, you don't find out his, his backstory or anything. So in that sense, like, uh, which isn't a bad thing, like I say, but it's really, he's not, he's not portrayed sympathetically. He's portrayed as kind of like a, an effective villain. Yeah. Someone who is, 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 what makes him interesting is the threat he presents more than, um, his actual character, mm -hmm. uh, I would probably say. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I think also the way, obviously, he kills the boss, Mr. Taka Martinami. Okay, try not to be racist. Okay. <laughs> uh, T Takagi. That was so close. Yeah, Mr. Taka uh, Takagi. I could have said ramen noodles. <sighs> Damn it. I could have said sushi. So, yeah, he just kills... Uh, the boss guy Takagi, and obviously <laughs> afterwards uh, just continues on like yeah, killing everyone. Happened, yeah, I don't know. Like, oh, can we talk about? It's the mix. Sorry, of, I'm sorry. It's just yeah. a mix of ruthlessness and like intelligence. Uh, again, like I said, he doesn't really do anything that seems too like clever, but he's just he just seems clever. He just, yeah, he just it just seems like he's a guy you would not want to go up against. Yeah, I mean, I guess it takes like some some degree of tactical skill to throw everything together. I mean, if it was easy to steal six hundred million dollars then well yeah. everyone would do it, wouldn't they? Luke? Guy, yeah, guy you should not underestimate, basically. I don't think he has any weaknesses apart from finding uh, some things too funny and laughing. That's that's, yeah, that's, that's his true. one weakness. That's his, that is his one weakness his, that his Achilles he laugh. laugh. Uh so if that's all we have to say in Hans Gruber. Mm -hmm. Move on to the next one. Which is Alexander Godunov as Karl Hans Savage main henchman. So I think he's the guy that obviously. Uh, yeah, the guy who gets shot. Yeah. And like lots of other. Yeah, there's only one guy in the whole film who gets shot. Yeah. So Alexander Godunov as Karl Hans Savage main henchman. So this guy obviously is uh, the brother of the other henchman, and you know, he's a very. Again, very scary looking, just with his hair and the way his like shirts unbuttoned, just like an absolute madman. A, uh, yeah. I mean, the description here is savage, which I think sums him up perfectly. Uh, 
and obviously you've got the contrast between him and Hans Gruber, you know, cool, meticulous uh, boss, and he's just a wild guy who can just be let loose uh, like an animal. Uh, and obviously, like we said before, or like I said before, the the fact that he is the brother uh, of uh, the person who gets killed by John McClane, uh, first off. Nice little detail. Stuff like that just makes the movie just that that bit better, so uh, well done for that. Yes, well done, people who made that film. This film. <laughs> the film that we are. That we, yeah. Um, I, I, he, looks, uh, he looks like he'd play a good Viking. Yeah, I guess so. He looks very Vikingy, and I I appreciate that. It's um, it feels very eighties. The kind of uh, like there's something about y- Europeans looking very European that feels very eighties. Like uh, you can imagine him having his own little Euro funk uh, industrial dance music. Yeah, is it that's because the Americans thought that's what Europeans look like? Yeah, that's what you Yeah, they were just walked around with like long blonde hair, uh, and they were all really tall, and they used to just go da. We will get to, but first we will make a song. Do, 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 do. And that's exactly what, that's why he, he does that. That's why he makes a song in, in this film, why he starts composing some disco music. Do, do. do you know uh, what nationality the guy actually was? Uh, Icelandic. Uh, Russian. Norwegian. Russian, yeah. okay. And do you know what his profession was? Apart from uh, being an actor. Communist. No. Um, wrestler. No. Uh, DJ. I was just going to say, uh, ballet dancer. Oh. <laughs> well, ballet dancers are strong. Yeah, exactly. And lots of people don't know that. No, pe- people, people don't know that. That if you're a man, people think you're ballet dancers are sissies. Yeah, if you're a man and you're a ballet dancer, it's like one of the most masculine things you can be. Uh, yeah. We learned that obviously from The Simpsons. And from Billy Elliot. Yes, <laughs> Billy Elliot. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, so next up we've got. Bonnie Bedelia as Holly Gennaro McLean. That's interesting that her character is listed as Gennaro McLean, not Gennaro or McLean. Uh, yeah, well, you know, that's the compromise. That's the compromise. Uh, John's estranged wife. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I, I love that little part of the movie where John's like just trying to make sure that the, the terrorists don't know that his wife is down there. And obviously, it works out conveniently that she did change her last name so that the uh, the terrorists uh, wouldn't immediately know that she was the wife of John McLean. Uh, obviously. So basically, this film has a low key uh, subliminal feminist message. Yeah. That you shouldn't keep your husband's name in case uh, some bad guys find out your husband's name and then they try and kill you. I mean, yeah, I, we I'll talk about that at the end. But yeah, I guess Holly Gennaro McLean is a good, strong woman who, you know, although she's in a hostage situation, you know, she, uh, she's, she, she's not, I guess, a damsel in distress. No. I would describe her as that. She's, yeah, she, uh, yeah, she, she's smart, you know, she's, uh, she's in distress, but she's not a damsel. Yeah. It's a good summary. Good summary. Um, next up, we've got Reginald Bell Johnson as Sergeant Al Powell. Yes. Uh, uh, this guy, again, like, this is how you can tell it was a novel before. Like, the, just the writing around this character, the fact that this character, who's just a standard cop, has a, has a backstory, has a character arc, uh, you know, is, like, has a personality. Like, it's, it's, it's just great. Like, this is what, this is why movies, like, have gotten so shit nowadays, because you just wouldn't get a character in this kind of movie. Like, fucking Skyscraper won't have a Sergeant Al Powell in that movie. It'll just be Dwayne the Rock. Johnson and a bunch of generic bad guys and generic cops and whatever that don't have anything different about them compared to the person standing next to them. So yeah. Nowadays, nowadays the cop would be Kevin Hart and he'd be like, uh, shit motherfucker, these guys are coming out the, throwing out the window and then he'd like karate kick someone at the end. Um, you know what? And it would, it would be fantastic. You know what Michael, during the NBA playoffs there was this Kevin Hart advert that kept running. My god, it was so fucking annoying. I just want to point that out. Uh, so next up we have Paul Gleason as Dwayne T. Robinson, the deputy chief of police. So this was the guy when uh, Sergeant Al Powell was telling him about all that was going on, and he was saying yeah. like, "How can?" And obviously the uh, deputy chief of police was saying how John McClane could actually be a terrorist on the inside, 
and Al, Sergeant Al Pal was saying, no, he can't be, like, the things he said, like, why, why would he be reporting this in the first place? Uh, and then <laughs> Al Pal says, such a weird name, Al Pal, uh, he says, well, what about the body that was thrown onto my car? How do you explain that? Like, if there's nothing going on inside that building. <laughs> and this fucking deputy chief of police, the guy who is meant to be a, I guess, a detective, a guy that puts two and two together, just says, probably a depressed stockbroker. Yeah, to be honest, I don't get it, because I don't get it. Like, there's a much more obvious. Like, if he was going to go down the route that Bruce Willis is a crazy person, you'd think he would have said, oh, Bruce Willis, or, or the, the crazy guy probably killed someone. Like, that would make more sense. Yeah. If, that would make not not that someone coincidentally threw themselves <laughs> off a window the same time that uh yeah when I heard that yes. line I was like wait what are you ser- are you serious I, okay I, I guess this guy has to be you know Luke that would have been a good nitpick yeah I know but I wanted to talk about him specifically relating yeah. to his character like this like, he's just an awful deputy chief of police how did he ascend to this position Michael if have you ever seen the story? episode of uh, the Simpsons where Chief Wiggum becomes uh, chief of police because he gives really good uh, back rubs. Mm, yeah, maybe that's the the reason why he got this job. Because it's just like okay, like I get like you have to have maybe a bit of conflict between Sergeant Al Powell, who seems to know more than the FBI guys, by the way, uh, which is another thing I want to talk about. Oh well, this is another good example of of what I was talking about the Sicario film, where it's American agencies, American law enforcement agencies literally hate each other. Yeah, but it's more than like you... that. It's like the, the fact that he knows what's going on more than the yeah, FBI yeah, yeah. Is, And obviously he knows what's going on more than the deputy chief of police of the LAPD, uh, who obviously is just like, what the fuck is... Like, are you, he's, he's not very good at his job, Michael, basically. And I know he's not meant to be very good at his job, that's the whole point, but like he's comically inept. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Next up we got... Oh my god. Devaru Devaru D- Devaru White as Argyle, John's limousine driver. Well, I would say that he is. You got anything to say about him, Luke? You know what? I was thinking when John was telling Argyle about his life. My God, like a cab drive is such a great way to get exposition out. Yeah, it's true. Actually. I was just, this is so useful. Like he can just. Like the cab driver's just nosy. Well, he's a limousine driver, obviously. But he's just asking questions. But he used to be a cab driver. He used to be a cab driver. Asking questions and all that. And John just has to, you know, has to tell him. So yeah. the audience, it's just a, such a great way. Like, if I ever need yeah. an exposition dump at one point in the movie, if I'm writing a screenplay or a script or whatever, that's... When, when you're writing a screenplay, yes. Luke, you have to believe in your dream. When, when. Of... Uh, I'm just going to, like, main character gets into cab. Cab driver is very nosy. Asks him a bunch of questions. But... Done. The thing is, uh, in, in the UK, the only thing you'd be able to find out is is how your character feels about all these uh, Muslims coming over taking our jobs. In, oh, in, God. In, in these days, the cab driver would be like, these days, if you say you're English, they'll arrest they'll you arrest and you. they'll throw you in prison. They'll throw you in prison. You know, what they're doing to Tommy Robinson, right, it's just an absolute disgrace. I thought we had yeah. freedom how of speech. It? Yeah, these Ramonas, they don't want England to get through to the final. <laughs> I haven't heard that actually. Actually, I did see something like that on Twitter. <laughs> well, I always remember in uh, in 2010, there was a whole thing going around that they, that the government was banning people from displaying England flags during the World Cup. Uh, uh, and I think another one was the government is banning people from wearing England tops during the like, World like, Oh yeah, if you wear the England sports gear, you'll be arrested for racism. I saw... <laughs> so, I saw but they're yeah. selling it. I saw this on Twitter. Uh, and this is genuinely true. Like, a Tommy Robinson supporter tweeted a picture of a man who was coming out of a house which was draped in England flags. And he said, see, they arrested him for putting up all his England flags. Like, there was a picture of the police dragging him away. <laughs> like, one of the replies was, <laughs> no, like, the, I live down the street from this guy. He got fucking arrested for being a nonce. And it was just like, yeah. it was just so perfect. Uh, but yeah, what were you we talking about? Uh, we were talking about Argyle and how he's a cab driver and it's a good way to get exposition. Yeah, so I, I think yeah, you're we right. summed up that topic quite well. Uh, next up is William Atherton as Richard Thornburg, an arrogant reporter. <laughs> Again, okay. This 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 guy is just is, he's just great. I love him. He's just <laughs> he's such a dick. But yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Just kind of like. Um, Again, another another case of just as if this was in a normal action movie, this character wouldn't exist. Uh, 
but I, I just love the fact that he's he's, he's such a, he's such an unlikable character. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, in in the nineteen eighties, they liked their uh, their unlikable characters who are ostensibly on the good guy's side, but they get in the way a lot. Like I feel like Terminator had that with the the psycho- Well, pretty much everyone who arrested Kyle Reese in Terminator, because uh, they were like, he's crazy. He thinks he's come back from the future. Uh, and there's a psychiatrist who's like, most paranoid delusions are intricate, but this guy's insane. Like, yeah, in the 1980s, they love that. They love the the yeah. guy who just he ruins everything. It's like, let's make him has just unlikable. Yeah, I think because I think like people realize that the villains obviously are meant to be villains. And so, I yeah. think, oh god, it's just it's just hilarious, like how much of a how much of a dick he is. Uh, yes. I believe he's in Die Hard 2 as well, so, like, obviously he lives in Los Angeles, so I don't know how he's in Die Hard 2, I'd have to watch it again, but I'm pretty sure he is somehow in uh, Die Hard 2. Uh, but yeah, so that's him, an arrogant reporter. Mm. Yes, that's uh, that's one word. Accurate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, then we got Clarence Gilliard as Theo, Hans Tech Specialist. Uh, another... Oh, I like this guy. Yeah, another... Yeah, that was the guy who said Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul yes. Jabbar. So I, I do like him. He's, yeah, he's got charisma. He's got style. Uh, you know, he, he knows what he's doing. Uh, yeah. He makes you sound a bit. Ra- it makes you sound a bit racist, Luke. He, no, he has got. The, so you're saying the black guy has style. He has got. The, the, did you see the way he? Sh- no, the way he jumped over <laughs> yes. that desk. Yeah, yeah, he was. Cool. And the, uh, the way he's calling out like where the uh, where the FBI are. Yeah. Yes, he's a he is he is a cool cool character, <laughs> a fun character. How did he die? Well, he gets did punched he? by the other black guy, Argyle. Uh, does he die then? I don't think or... he dies. No, I don't think a punch would oh, kill him. That's kind of and cool. Argyle gives Very a nice, nice smile actually after he punches ha- him. Haven't, yeah. haven't you ever read the uh, the Strontium Dog comic where uh, Strontium Dog punches someone in the face so hard that he breaks his nose, and then the you nose know what, goes Michael, into have, his brain? I actually have enjoyed it a lot. Have you ever seen the Game of Thrones episode? No, where... I hate that show. Do you hate it? Oh, we, we no, should I don't hate, that I don't hate the show. I don't. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's got too much sex and violence. What is that? And it keeps I'd me say? up past my bedtime. So that's that's my impression of you, you oh, old fogey. Wow. <laughs> you old fogey. You. Uh, so next up we've got oh this this guy I love this guy as well Hart Botchner as Harry Ellis, a sleazy Nakatomi executive. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I wanted to talk about this guy because I've been thinking about this guy in my head for a while. Ever since you mentioned how uh, ruthless um, Hans Gruber is, the fact that he just like shoots this guy, uh, but also this guy is just like such a, he's just such a, such an ass. <laughs> he's such a wank. I wonder what, what a wank. Uh, if the reporter met this guy, would they get along? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I feel like it's one of those things where actually their, their personalities would conflict, even though they're very similar people, because their personalities are naturally... Uh, that they'd both want to be the biggest dicks in the room, and they would end up outdicking each other or, or fighting to outdick each other. Yeah, I mean, what a it, it's like it is. It's kind of uh, bordering on on silly how ridiculous the executive because he walks in like, "Hey, bub, you know, I'm a smooth talking guy, and I think I think we can sort something out. I think I can make it worth your while." And Hans Gruber's just like, "Hmm, no, I think I'll kill you." Yeah. Um, and the fact that he doesn't believe Hans Gruber will actually shoot him. <laughs> yeah. He's like, hey, stop play acting. He's going to shoot me, Dan. Come on. <laughs> it's such an exaggeration, uh, which I, I I do like, obviously. This movie, I mean, it kind of takes itself seriously, but not that seriously. So. Oh, you know what, Luke? This, this actually makes me think of something, which I kind of want to say. Hans Gruber should have just said that he would execute hostages, because it was very easy to let that guy die. But it kind of got me thinking, like, if Hans Gruber just said, I'm going to execute hostages unless you give me the things I want, then I don't know what John McClane would have done. Hans Gruber doesn't seem to... He, he kills that guy, but he doesn't seem to go to the next logical conclusion, which is to say, hey, don't you know, bring me this or I will kill a hostage. So I don't know why he doesn't do that. It probably would have worked, because I don't think John McCain, McClane... They just said McCain, that's funny. <laughs> um, John McCain would have let... Someone die. Yeah. I mean, you know, someone who wasn't an arsehole. We didn't, so, stupid Hans Gruber. We didn't talk about that, actually. How similar John McClane's name is to John McCain. Well, I like your heroes that weren't caught. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, you know what would have been great? <laughs> Donald Trump as the uh, the business executive. I can't remember his name. But the guy who gets shot by Hans Gruber. Did Donald Trump, he was like, Hey, guy, listen, 
I know a thing or two about hostage negotiation, and I think you and I could work something out. We're going to get a, a great deal. I'm going to bring you John McCain. None of these other guys can bring you John McCain, but I can, and then you just get shot. It'll be great. Yeah. Let me tell you, it's going to be great. We're going to bring in John McCain, and he's going to... <laughs> these, I, I call them low-energy John. <laughs> Did you see his Die Hard 5 performance? Absolutely awful. <laughs> Uh, then we got anyway, yes. Yeah, we got James Shigeta as Nakaho- Nakatomi's head executive, Joseph Yoshinobu Takagi. Uh, uh, he's not. He's not very really interesting. No, he's not. He dies an honourable death. Honourable? That's racist. No, it's just... it's, it's ra- cute saying a Japanese person does something honourable is racist. <gasps> yeah. Okay. Uh, so he just, you know, he commits harakiri because he doesn't want to lose his money. Yeah, he doesn't want to lose his money. The company's money. And again, he calls hands. Uh, oh, sorry, Hans Gruber's bluff, but obviously he wasn't bluffing, and he kills him. Yeah, he calls his yeah. his non bluff. Yeah, his non bluff. His nuff. His nuff. So that's yeah, that's another great thing about Hans Gruber. Doesn't, he doesn't bluff. He doesn't bluff. Just doesn't bluff. Makes him that ex- extra yeah. scary. Uh, so those are all the characters. Like I said, uh, I think overall the characters in this movie really elevate it, make it more than just an action movie, which would have been a good action movie. Anyway, like I said, but yeah, I think overall, yeah, this these these characters they've all got backstories. They've all got you know something that makes them interesting. Uh, actually, do you know what we had, didn't talk about the FBI people? Oh fuck them! <laughs> like FBI agent Big Johnson and I feel like they're kind of covered under the the head of the LAPD. Like they're kind of a similar deal. Yeah, they're just nonsense. But did you did you see the? Like, they were in the helicopter, like, about a kill terrorist, and they said, there was a line like, oh, you know, if we do this, we'll kill 25 to 20% of the hostages or something like that. And the other one said, I can live with that. It's yeah, like, well, yeah. Wait, what? Are these guys many the of the good guys? <laughs> like, yes. apparently every good person, apart from the cop and John McLean, are just fucking idiots. Like, from the, uh, and obviously his wife, from the sleazy Nakatomi executive, Harry, uh, Harry Ellis, to the uh, arrogant reporter, Richard Thornburg, mm. to the deputy chief of police, to the FBI guys. Thank God John McClane was there. Thank God he was Yeah, there. what a hero. What a hero. Uh, so, anyway, the are we action. done with the characters? Yeah, the action. What was it I was going to say about the action, Luke? Can you remember? No. Because I can. Okay, so basically you were talking about the fact that the the bad guys are, are kind of interesting. There's There's some time taken to develop the character of the bad guys, like, for example, the two people being brothers and things like that. And one of the things that I think this film benefits from is there aren't that many bad guys. And one of the things I wrote down was, in, in a lesser action film, he would have just killed people with ease. There would have been a scene where, you know, there's like eight guys in a room, he jumps in there and he just goes, boom, 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 headshot, all eight of them. Uh, but instead, no, he, he takes it takes him uh, a, a considerable amount of effort and even some luck to kill each person or, you know, small group of people that he kills. And that means that, you know, you first of all kind of get to know the bad guys a bit. I mean, obviously not that much because you know, it doesn't matter that much. But um, also it just makes it kind of more entertaining. Like one of my one of my pet peeves is um, a, 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 an action film where there are so many bad guys at once that it just becomes like ridiculous and it almost reaches a point where it's not even impressive yeah. that the bad guy can defeat it because it's like um like uh you know the scene in Kill Bill? See I don't like the scene that much where she fights like a billion um ninjas at once. But the thing is she's not fighting them at once because there's so many of them that they can't all attack at once. So really, she's only fighting like two guys at once and the rest of them are just kind of dancing around waiting politely for their turn. Yeah, but that was Quentin Tarantino's... Yeah, I know, yeah. Off. Yeah, I don't, I don't blame... Yeah. But but the thing is, you do see that in a lot of kung fu films, where it's like, hey, they're going to fight ten guys, but actually, like, realistically, because... Yeah, in It Man. You know, yeah, because realistically, you can't yeah. physically fight ten people. It's actually just they're fighting one person while nine people dance around. Uh, but yeah, so he kills only only twelve people to kill, and it takes him some effort to kill them, so, uh, and it is... Re- it's restraint. That's, that's a yeah. real word. Restraint. Restraint, yes. Um, certainly, it's very hard for him to kill people. He's not successful with everything that he does, uh, which is nice to see. You know, he doesn't do anything totally crazy when killing uh, the bad guys. No, yeah, I think that 
almost I, I think yeah the things you do are are physically possible i i think it's probably luck is the number one thing uh yeah that, that is a bit like unlikely uh because there are a few moments where you think oh that's convenient but yeah like physically speaking i think most of the stuff was actually quite realistic for you know even just an average person yeah like i mean it's just jump around fire a gun hide do a little yeah. dance yeah hide yeah he's not a yeah he's he's not i mean there's a there's one death which I was like, uh, I kind of rolled my eyes out when the guy stopped shooting him while he was under the table. Oh yeah, that's a silly death. Yeah, and then he's like, oh, you should always shoot when you have the chance. And then John McClane shoots him and says, thanks for the advice. It's like, yeah, that that kind of stuff wasn't in that movie that much, so I appreciate yeah. that. Like, maybe you got to have one like cheesy death or like one of those, you know, quick uh, witted lines. Uh, yeah. Also, actually, I didn't. Um, I thought it was like kind of lucky, and uh, uh, when he doesn't get shot on the vent. Uh, and again, my my general one of the things that I prefer in an action film, I think I've mentioned this before, is to have uh, as little luck as possible yeah. on the side of the hero, because obviously, you know, if the, if it's literally reaches a point where it's just like, well, you know, he could have been dead if those bullets were more accurate. And yeah, like a couple of times it doesn't matter. But uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So not not not. Super, yeah, very lucky. Yeah, so I, yeah, that was one instance where it's quite lucky, but you know, you st- I think in that scene you still felt the tension. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think in all the action scenes. Now I know how a TV dinner feels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I thought about that line. It's just so out of place. Like, just... They reference it in Family Guy. Ah. Uh, it's an episode based on Back to the Future, where uh, Brian and Peter go back in time. Yeah. Because. Uh, for, for complicated reasons, but the important thing is they go back to the 1980s, and um, he, there, there's calling for an event, and Peter goes, now I know how a TV dinner feels. That's a line from Die Hard. Hey, Brian, that film hasn't been made yet. We could make it. We could make Die Hard. Uh, obviously. That's, that's the joke? Yeah, but. It's funny, isn't it? Obviously. It would have been novel. It would have been novel, so they clearly didn't do their research at Family Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy. The hacks. Uh, well, we don't know when the novel was written. Maybe the novel, maybe it's one of those, like for example, Jurassic Park was written as a novel in the early nineties. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah, there we go. Never mind. Yeah. So yeah, uh, it had been written. Um, yeah. So I think we can give the action scenes a thumbs up. I mean, that's really the reason why it's so popular. Like, I think that's the in action movies, and surprisingly, the meat is the action movie. And everything else around it, I think, elevates the movie. But if your if your action isn't great or is just below average, then it's not going to be uh, a good action movie, regardless of the characters and all the nice little details uh, and how well the plot works and the villains and all that. The, the action has to work, and yes, obviously the action does very much work in Die Hard. Uh, so next up, Michael, we're all done on action. Mm-hmm. Got to talk about. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie or not? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no, Luke. Are you gonna say it's not a Christmas movie? Okay, so first of all, uh, I assume you're familiar with the Christian comedy YouTube channel Lutheran Satire. You know what, Michael? I think you're just making these things up most of the time. No, see, well, basically, no. There's actually quite a funny line in one of them, which is, uh, there's there's these two people, and all you really need to know is that they're talking about how people in the future, because these people are like in the 1800s, and they're, they're some old 1800s theologians, and they're like, in the future, people don't celebrate Christmas for the Jesusness. They spend their Christmas, uh, you know, eating eating loads of food and opening presents and debating whether or not Die Hard is a Christmas film, and uh, the other one says, that's terrible. Of course, Die Hard is a Christmas film. And the message there, Luke, is that is that a Christian YouTube comedy channel can be funny. Um, <laughs> but the important that's thing, a so real miracle. Here's here's the thing about um, this film being a Christmas film. Number one, Luke, it wasn't made. It wasn't released during Christmas. No, actually, I uh, spoke to Dylan about that. I told him he, we were reviewing Die Hard, but he was like, "Oh, it's a Christmas movie." I was like, "Yeah, I know, but it was released like 30 years ago this week." You fucking idiot! I didn't say that. <laughs> you can't. But, <laughs> yeah, obviously that's. He, he was surprised by the fact that it was released in July. Yeah. Um, also, uh, do you know what is a Christmas film? Uh, Daddy's Home 2. Even though Daddy's Home 2 was released in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so no. The parallels Disaster. are just... But Daddy's Home 1 
was released in Christmas. But Danny Sim Two was released on in November. Oh, was it? Okay, I thought I thought you said that it was released in the summer, but maybe I'm lying. Um, so <laughs> yeah, you know what, Luke? I, I actually have a question that is. Oh, well, first of well, all, answer, okay, do you think so it's I'm. Christmas, maybe, I, I don't think that I actually don't think Die Hard is a Christmas film. I don't think. See, I want to say I don't think it's a Christmas film because it wasn't released as a Christmas film. But more than that, I just think um, it's it's not that Christmassy, really. Like it's it's really not very Christmassy. It's it's staggeringly not Christmassy. Apart from the fact that there are a few sly references to Christmas, and I guess there is Christmas music, but it's like. There's, there's, you just, I mean, okay, do you think it's a Christmas film, and... I'm going to say yes, it is. I feel like, see, the thing is, ultimately, uh, there's, like, I don't think there's much to debate about it, apart from just that it doesn't seem very Christmassy, but I do want to say this. Seeing as there's nothing to debate about it, I want to say one final thing, seeing as we're not, we're not strapped for time. Um, one of the reasons I think people say this film is a Christmas film is because, uh, there aren't that many good christmas films <laughs> yeah and people want to have a good christmas film so it's like this is you know if you want to watch a film on christmas which kind of makes sense as a thing to do then it makes sense to be like hey let's watch die hard although it's kind of weird because it's got loads of swearing in it like i don't know i mean i don't think i'm going to care too much about swearing yeah. if and when i have a family but uh no, but yeah it's, like it is quite it's a great excuse actually I mean, that, maybe that's just why people say it's a Christmas movie, so they can watch yeah, it at Christmas time. Instead exactly. Of but, but my question, given that, that's the main excuse. Yeah. Uh, my question is, what do you think, apart from Die Hard, is the best Christmas film? Uh, 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 it's a Wonderful Life. Okay, yeah, that's that's not bad. I don't know. Um, I actually don't, I don't have a, a real answer to you. Like, I asked the question. I don't have much of an answer. Elf? Um... Yeah, I think the thing is, like, I don't... So I haven't seen Elf in a while. I feel like Elf isn't actually that funny. Um, I feel like it's one of the worst films by Will Ferrell. Wow. It's just my, my recollection of it. Um, well, okay, I'm going to stick up for Die Hard right now. So some critics have ranked Die Hard. Uh, it's, I'm just going to stick up for Die Hard being a Christmas movie, I should say. Some wait, critics... I'm going to look up best Christmas films yeah. just for the record. Some critics have ranked the film on respective lists of the all-time best Christmas films as the following... Digital Sun Spy says it's the fifth best Christmas movie ever. Empire says it's the best Christmas movie ever. Well, yeah, I think, like... Thor says the it's thing. the best. And so. San Francisco Gate says it's the best. The Guardian says uh, it's the eighth best Christmas movie. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to run some... I think I'm going to go for Rotten Tomatoes. We love Rotten Tomatoes, don't we, Luke? Yeah, it's um, great. Although, actually, it's taking a while to end. So maybe I'll just do what Google says. Okay, actually, you know what? I think some of these are good shouts, so... Uh, Christmas films according to Google. Mm -hmm. It's a Wonderful Life, which you mentioned, but this one's a good shout. Home Alone. I think Home Alone is is uh, not too bad. Mm -hmm. Elf. Uh, I know you don't like this film. Uh, Love Actually. Uh, do you like that film? I think it is. Um, see, I think it, it's not a bad film in that kind of genre of feel good uh, romantic films. I, I I would happily watch it. If if someone was like, hey, we're watching this, but I don't want to get into too much of a debate about it. Okay, this, okay, The Muppets Christmas Carol. I think that's a good film. Nightmare Before Christmas, which we have actually, spoiler alert, decided we're going to review next Christmas or something. Have we? Um, didn't, isn't it on that? I, Nightmare I Before Christmas? We, oh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, we're going to review that at Christmas. Yeah. Okay, Christmas. wait. Uh, this, I've got, I've got the Rotten Tomatoes list up. Okay, so it's got, uh, Miracle on 34th Street. I haven't even heard of this one. I haven't even heard of loads of these. Loads of these are from like the, the 1500s or something. Holiday Inn, The Shop Around the Corner, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. You've not heard of uh, that one? Uh, Die Hard is number seven. Wow. Arthur, Arthur Christmas, A Christmas Story, A Charlie Brown Christmas, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Oh, what a great movie that uh, is. Do you remember when we were playing 20 Questions and I didn't know that Rudolph Reindeer had been in a film? Or Rudolph had been in a film? No, I don't. Um... Okay, Absolutely. well, someone had Rudolph written as, like, their, their thing that you have to guess. Um, and the one of the questions was, have I been in a film? And everyone's like, yeah. And I was like, have they? And you're like, uh, yeah. He's been in loads of films, but I've never seen or heard of a film. Trading Places, uh, that was a great Christmas day. Carol. Oh, actually, this one's not a bad show. <laughs> Batman Returns, which does have something to do with Christmas. What? And it's not... It, it, it's, um... So... The penguin gets abandoned on Christmas Eve, 
uh, Danny DeVito gets abandoned on Christmas Eve and it's snowing. But I think this film sounds great. It's a, it's a Christmas horror film called Better Watch Out. And the, uh, the, the cover art is somebody with like a baseball bat with Christmas lights wrapped around it. You know, the way they kind of like wrap yeah, yeah, barbed yeah. wire around Christmas. Yeah. And it looks just, just fantastic. This, the, the holiday season, you may be home, but you're not alone. In this fresh and gleefully twisted spin on home invasion horror, babysitter Ashley must defend her young char- charges uh, when intruders break into the house one snowy night. Wow. Or well, so she thinks. Or so she thinks. Interesting. Ooh. I think that means that the intruder is actually Santa. I don't know, but apparently that is the uh, is in the 25 best Christmas. So maybe that gives you an idea of slim pickings on Christmas. Yeah. Um, uh, so I watched Mouse Hunt on Christmas. Have you ever seen Mouse Hunt? No. Oh, damn it. Well, it's a film about some guys who hunt for a mouse. Uh, okay. So I, th- I just want to say I think this is a Christmas movie because, like, it, the plot involves Christmas. The whole reason why uh, the claims yeah. there is it the fact that it's a Christmas party, uh, and his obviously his wife invited him because it, it's she's holding a Christmas party. So yeah, it involves Christmas. Like it's not it's yeah. a case of it's a case of Christmas being integral to the movie's plot because if Christmas isn't happening, then there's no there's no dieharding. So that's that's a good that's a good argument. Yeah, Luke. it's um, like obviously. It, uh, Christmas just had to happen, like which is passing through. Like, I'm sure there's been some movies where it just happens to be Christmas, and it's not a Christmas movie. Uh, obviously, like what others may feel that since the film isn't actually about Christmas itself, it focuses on you know the action of police officers and terrorism. Should we consider a Christmas film? But I'm like, you know what? No, this this movie Christmas isn't involved in this movie. You know, like Christmas parties are a very integral part of Christmas. So yeah, this is a Christmas movie, and I will watch it. On Christmas, ahead of like fifty other so-called Christmas, no, fifty other Christmas movies. Uh, yeah, I um, I think that you you you've, you've somewhat convinced me. Uh, I think no matter what, I would say watch it at Christmas. Um, I feel like there's kind of like different tiers of Christmas films, and that's kind of something to bear in mind. So there are films that are very much about Christmas and play, you know, essentially off key themes of christmas like for example elf or you know, you're like films where it's literally the characters and the plot is specifically related to the, the christmas mythos mm-hmm. uh and then there are films um that for example like you said just happen to take place in christmas and then there are films that are not about christmas themselves but um the plot is kicked off by christmas and Example of that would be yep. the first Daddy's Home. Uh, Daddy's Home Two is 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 in is in tier one. That is about Christmas, I'd argue. But Daddy's Home One is just it's it's a bad, Christmas is is part of the plot, but it's not. Uh, Wait, is it? I mean, they have Christmas in like April. Yeah, well, you know, Christmas happens. Like Christmas happens. Ipso facto. It's not really Christmas what's... happens. So what you're saying? Uh, anyway, is... Oh yeah. Anyway, so I'd say yeah. what I'd say is so so when you're talking about what's the best Christmas or is something a Christmas film, I would say. This is more of a Christmas film than just a film where Christmas happens. Yes. So, but it's not as much of a Christmas film as a film where you know the plot is. If it was, um, if instead Bruce Willis had to work with Santa to retrieve uh, all of um, Hans Gruber stole Santa's presents, which totaled six hundred million dollars in value, uh, but mm. Bruce Willis had to take down Hans Gruber so Santa could get the presents in time, <laughs> then it would be a, a tier one Christmas film. Yeah. So I, what you're saying is essentially there's uh, three tiers of Christmas movies and Die yeah. Hard would be in the second tier where Chris, Christmas needs to happen for the movie to, to work but obviously it's not actually about Christmas so yeah yes. I, that's where the debate is and I'm going to say I'm going to say that's enough for it to be a Christmas movie uh, and obviously you know what, fight me yeah, yeah well I'll fight you if you, you pick the skyscraper and okay. I'll take you out and, and all your henchmen. Yes. Uh, next up, Michael, I want to discuss something else about Die Hard, which is the quotes in the movie. Yippee Kaye. Yippee Kaye, motherfucker. That's the famous one. Or oh, I think the most famous one. There's also Welcome to the Party, Pal. Now I have a machine gun. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, wait, I want to talk about that one because uh, in Civilization 4. One of the things that leaders will say to you after they've discovered a new technology is, I have a blah, 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 ho, ho, ho. So 
you'll talk to China and China's just discovered the wheel and horseback riding and I'll be like now I have a chariot ho 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 or they've just discovered iron working and I'll be like now I have a swordsman ho 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 um, and that's what they say when they're kind of like threatening you so there we go that's yeah, a that's context of that quote uh, Hans Gruber saying I'm going to count to three there will not be there a will front. not be a that's, a that's a great quote just some Hans Gruber up perfectly that quote now I know what a TV dinner feels like classic um <laughs> Uh, what are the, what are the ones? Oh yeah, so there's this one in which um, the uh, the cop uh, Al Powell says, which I think I think it's a famous line. I don't know. He's, he talk about the time when he shot a kid, and he delivers it in such a dramatic way. It's just it's just so good. And he goes, "I shot a kid. He was 13 years old. It was dark. I could see him. He had a ray gun. Like real enough. You know, when you're a rookie, they can teach you everything about being a cop except how to live with a mistake." I just couldn't bring Classic. it. Classic. <laughs> and it's so and it's so quotable. Yeah. It's like it's just so it's just a great line. It's such a great cop line. Uh which which out of those is your favourite? Uh my favourite of them all. Um I think you know what, okay, so here's the one thing I find weird. There aren't that many lines he says immediately before killing someone. No. He says uh I think that's good, I like that. Yeah, yeah, he says the one line the the one line he says immediately before killing someone is literally the worst killing someone where he says, Thanks for the advice. Yeah. Um Well that's after he does. So he's definitely not Arnold Schwarzenegger levels. <laughs> I liked when um when <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger he, he throws a pipe at someone and pins them to a steam vent. This is not at all contrived. Pins them to a steam vent such that uh the pipe pierces the steam vent and steam escapes from the pipe at which point Arnold Schwarzenegger says let off some steam Bennett <laughs> oh, so great. classic uh, I think to be honest I'm going to have to go for the classic which is yippee ki motherfucker yeah I think it's just I'm going it's just so that. great it is um, great yippee ki motherfucker what a great line what a great and line. it's good given the context yeah you think you are a cowboy hmm? yeah yippee ki yes motherfucker. I would I would like to say it it's, the, it's, it's, it's what I would say when I when I move to America and there is a, a mass shooting and I'm a good guy with a gun, mm. um, one of the famed good guys with a gun. I'm gonna get my gun and I'm gonna shoot the guy and just before I shoot, I'm gonna go yippee kaye, motherfucker. It's not, and then mm. and then it's gonna turn out that actually the person I shot was an unarmed <laughs> black child. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, okay. It. Back to the line. I think it's a perfect mix between like wildness and just coolness. It's, it's just that it gels together so perfectly. And I think that's why it's such a memorable line. Um, so yeah, so there you go. Those are the movie quotes, which, you know, this movie yes. isn't the most quotable, I'd say, but it's definitely like the EPK game of the fucker line. Definitely quite quotable uh, in some aspects. Next up, I want to I wanna discuss a, a, uh, a hypothesis of mine, Michael. Yes. Uh, that Die Hard is what I... A Christmas film. It's a Christmas film. But Die Hard is also what I would describe as probably the most blue-collar movie I have ever seen. Uh, just, just... And what about... Okay. Um, Grown Ups 2. No, I haven't seen Grown Ups 2, and I don't think that's blue-collar. <laughs> no, it isn't, actually. I feel like it's blue-collar in terms of its target audience, but... White collar in terms of its seams. Why so are you saying blue collar people are stupid? Ah, uh, because that's the target no, audience of Adam. So I'm saying that there are more blue collar people, <laughs> and therefore, therefore they're going to have a wider uh, net of people in who can be stupid. Okay, so I'm not talking about necessarily blue collar people, but uh, so the people <laughs> who would laugh at um at by the way, Michael, one minute a balloon has just floated up into the air from one of the gardens. I can see it from the window. That's crazy. Yeah, it's flying. That's beautiful. Sky. It's beautiful. Um, so much beauty in the world. But yeah, Grown Ups 2 is someone watching that would go, Aha! He just fell over! Hey, Bonnie May, come see what the funny man on the television box just did. Bonnie May. So, in other words, yeah, Bonnie May. That's, fucking great that's, that's name. a great name. Um, that's, that's, so, that's, that's actually a great name. It's like, I don't think I've ever heard of someone or a character being called Bonnie May before, but it still sounds like over the top redneck. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway. By the way, um, blue collar, though, I, isn't the same as redneck, though. Yeah, I know, but that's kind of why I realised, yeah, I was conflating all, all subaltern 
versions or classes in American society with the blue collar, but that's not really yeah. accurate. So, um, so I'm so, just going to describe why I think it's yes, the blue collar maybe ever. Because policemen wear blue, yeah. and therefore their collars are blue. Makes sense, yeah. So obviously John McClane is out of place in Los Angeles. That's made clear when he sees like a very attractive girl running past him and he just goes, California. Huh. Uh, and also, there's something else. Which makes... Did someone tries to kiss him or something? Oh, yeah, yes. Like a man tries to hug him or... Yeah, yeah, some guy kisses him and says, Merry Christmas. And he's like, oh, a lot of fruits out here. Uh, he's <laughs> you know... damn faggots. <laughs> then he shoots him. So obviously he's surrounded by coastal elites. Uh, you know, these very rich people who live in Los Angeles. Um, but he he still saves the day. He uses his street smarts to overcome the terrorists. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He gets uh, his wife moving to Los Angeles and leaving him and doing fine on her own. It's kind of emasculated him, made him feel like less of a man. But then he saves his wife at the end, showing that yes. he's still the man of the house. Uh, he, uh, the uh, the schmoozer, that's what I labeled him as, or the... The yuppie, he's a yuppie. The yuppie, yeah, exactly, the yuppie, the guy that does cocaine, the immoral... The guy, the guy who pulled straight out of American Psycho. Yeah, the sleazy Nakatomi executive. That guy who tries to, uh, who's been trying to schmooze. schmooze his wife, you know, trying to take his wife from her. Well, he, he gets killed because he's, he's stupid actually. He's, he's too arrogant, you know, he's too, uh, too in your face with his style, you know, he's not down to earth enough. Uh, and obviously, you know, he, Bruce, uh, John McClane, Bruce Willis, very blue collar looking guy as well. You know, he, uh, he saves the day, you know, he saves all these rich yuppies and fucking coastal elites. From the uh, from the terrorists, you know, and uh, doesn't mm. doesn't mess around while doing it. True action hero, you know, saves his wife at the end, regardless of the fact that she makes more money than him. That doesn't that doesn't matter at the end of the day. And even the name yes. of the movie, Die Hard, is such a simple name. Like, yeah, because they die earlier. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it doesn't doesn't beat around the bush. Just Die Hard, like just the way the way you say. Yeah, so, whereas otherwise they'd be like, what the hell's a vengeance? <laughs> What's that big word on the end of that here movie title? You know, it's like, hmm. He, he, he doesn't die easily. Like, he, he, it's very hard for him to die, so what do we call it? It's just Die Hard. It's just such a yeah. fucking blue-collar name for a movie, Die Hard. So yeah, that's, that's why I think it's a very, very blue-collar film. I guess, you know, that's why. E- even though I'm not a guy who's blue collar and I don't think you are either you wear white collars you, you don't think I am <laughs> I'm actually right now you know what Luke I am actually wearing a blue collar wow. right now that's, that's fascinating uh, on, my, on my polo shirt which is of course <laughs> not at all a middle class thing to wear on my polo shirt mm, yes. a blue collar I've got plenty of blue polo shirts mm. uh, I spent ages ironing the creases out of my blue collars yeah so yeah that's it die hard uh, yeah. Do you want to know what is the least uh, working class film ever? Uh, yes. Is, Stuart, Stuart uh, is... <laughs> no, it's it's yes, the hills it have eyes. Sorry, what? It's the hills. It's the hills have eyes. The fuck is that? You see, in the hills have eyes, a, a coastal kind of hippie liberal who doesn't like he gets chastised. He goes on holiday or a road trip with his girlfriend's family, and the girlfriend's dad chastises him for uh, for not believing in like guns like he the, the girlfriend's dad's like shooting a gun and he's like you don't believe in guns do you anyway so i don't know if you know the basic plot of the hills have eyes but it's it's uh hillbilly mutants and these hillbilly mutants basically attack the the family and they kill the dad and like all of the the brothers and stuff uh and then it's just this this coastally liberal hippie and he saves the day he he goes in and without using a gun he's able to just beat people up using the the sheer power of his his soy gains just uses the power of soy to just defeat them. Uh, and that is the most... Uh, it's a real punch in the face to, to the working class. <laughs> but the most the most working class film would be if Bruce Willis was from, um, like, some flyover state and uh, and he was in a college campus and they invited some terrorists over to speak because they didn't want to seem racist. But then the terrorists took over and they were like, well, we can't shoot them because then we'd use guns. And uh, and the Nebraska police was like, Hoo, liberals, and then he saved the day. Yeah, uh, I guess. <laughs> and then and then he kissed a woman without expressly asking for affirmative consent. And uh, although she complained deep down, she secretly liked it. Yeah, 
Yes, exactly. <laughs> Classic. Classic. Um, uh, she said, I don't need feminism when I've got a man like you. <laughs> that was her character arc. I guess dick really is better than feminism. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, there we go. Die Hard. Uh, oh, just one last mention on the legacy of Die Hard. Uh, by the way, the second film is also based on the book. Yeah, I'm not surprised, because yeah. certainly, uh, I mean, it's not as good, but it's still like, it, it makes it kind of it kind of makes sense how he would be in a, in a similar situation, but yeah, uh, I, I don't. Have you seen Die Hard two recently? Uh, no, not recently no. at all. Yeah. And I, yeah, I don't think I've seen Die Hard three at all, which is funny because that's the one you said. Yeah, I think literally what I've seen in in my memory is Die Hard, the good one, and then the last two Die Hard films, which are both terrible. So you should watch Die Hard with a Vengeance. See what you think. Uh, yes, I will. So the film spawned four sequels: Die Hard, Die Hard with a Vengeance, like we just said, nineteen ninety and nineteen ninety five. Those when those uh, that was when those movies came out. Live Free or Die Hard two thousand seven, A Good Day to Die Hard twenty thirteen, and uh, in July two thousand seven, Bruce Willis donated the undershirts worn in the film to the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian Institution. So there you go. Uh, the films. So obviously, like you can see how famous it is when. Like this, the vest he wore, and it is an iconic vest. I'd say, like when you see someone like in a dirty vest and you know those uh, trousers without any socks, it just looks—it's the die-hard look. Um, yes. The uh, uh, but there's going to be a sick form, by the way. Is there? Uh, there's in 2010 when the film formally announced the production of the fifth film, Bruce Willis expressed his desire to retire the character in the sixth film. Uh, director Len Wiseman posted a single image reading "Die Hard Year One" on his Twitter account. When was this? Um, October 2015. All oh, right, okay. I mean, maybe I don't know when that's going to come out because it'll have to be earliest 2020. So we'll see. But yeah. Um, oh wait, it's based on a comic book. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that's interesting. Um, the film's title and its story of a lone hero battling a multitude of single-minded opponents in an isolated setting also became a common descriptor for later action films. Die Hard on a became a simple and easy way to define the plot of many action films that came in its wake. For example, the 1992 film Under Siege was referred to as Die Hard on the Battleship. The 1992 film Passenger 57 was nicknamed Die Hard on a Plane. The 1994 film Speed was called Die Hard on a Bus. And the 1996 The Rock was dubbed Die Hard on an Island. Okay, well basically, have you in Simpsons, there's an episode where Otto is driving the bus really fast, yeah. and Milhouse says, this is just like Die Hard 2, except it's on a bus instead of a boat. Uh, but more importantly... I uh, just thought of another film, an action film that involves some people in a high-rise building trying to escape. The French zombie film La Horde uh, is a policeman goes up to arrest some gangsters, but while they're in there, a zombie outbreak happens, and the policeman and the gangsters have to team up to fight their way through the multi-story uh, apartment building past hordes of zombies. Yes. So yeah, uh, the have you seen Olympus is Fallen? Uh, London is Fallen. No, Olympus. Oh. I thought there was another film called London. Yeah, one. I think that was a sequel. No, I haven't seen either. Yeah, well, okay, it was yeah, basically The White House. So, Die Hard in the White House, that's how it was described. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I think, obviously, like, this movie you can see from its legacy, but just the, the the simple nature of the movie and how effective it was and how captivating and gripping also made this a great template for action movies, uh, first of its kind, so it just deserves a lot of props for that. Um, so, yeah, I think, obviously... I think pretty much everyone has seen Die Hard. Like uh, IGN listed it as the top spot on their list of top 25 action movies. It is the OG of action movies. It is the one that everyone thinks of when they think of action movies. Uh, Bruce Wayne, Bruce fucking Bruce Willis, and John McClane are the actor and the uh, character that everybody thinks of when they think of action movies. And obviously, still to this day, it is probably like. Around Christmas every year, it gets put on one of the like channels, like in our country, like Channel Four or ITV Two. They'll probably play Die Hard, and I don't know when it's going to stop, but it'll probably continue for a while. Uh, yes, yeah, one of the greatest movies, probably, but not maybe in like how good it is, but just legacy-wise and how famous it is ever. And certainly, I think if we're talking exclusively about action movies, probably the best of all time. Yes, very, very true. Um, so now. I think it's time to, well, to be honest with you, I was just about to say it's time to wrap up. Uh, I feel like you've already done quite a good wrap up there. Yeah. That, uh, 
if there's anything you'd like to add and then maybe maybe give it a rating. Yeah, uh, so I'll just finish by saying that, yeah, I think it's a very good action movie. Well, it's the best action movie, you know. Like, I don't think I've enjoyed an action movie more than this. Um, action movies aren't really my thing. Um, so I'm just going to give it a good old 8 out of 10. Uh, and for someone, you know, who doesn't like action movies to give a rating that high, I think, you know, you can see how, how good it is uh, from the characters to the uh, the villains to the action, I guess. Yeah, it's just it's just really good all that. So yeah, eight out of ten, very solid. Yeah, uh, I I agree. Um, I think this is a a really kind of simple, effective film. It is it makes good uh, use of of a simple premise that can kind of uh, is is made interesting by how how much it sticks with it. And how it kind of allows it to develop naturally, uh, and also it's like I say, it's it's interesting in that there is some restraint, and it's not just uh, Bruce Willis has to charge at a tank at full speed and then drop some C four inside it and then run away while jumping over a spinning helicopter blade. Uh, it's it's simple, and he doesn't fly a motorbike into a helicopter um, in order to take down that helicopter, which I think is a win in anyone's books. Um, now, I'm going to rate this between... So, above Sicario, just because, you know, it's, it's fun, yeah. um, and below Deadpool, um, which I actually also don't feel is that controversial. I think Deadpool just did a bit more. Uh, another fun thing I did, because um, right now, as you well know, Luke, I'm going through... Uh, the films that we watched in the first quarter of this year, mm -hmm. and something I decided to do just out of fun, I've moved a few of the films around, you'll be excited to know, but I also decided that I would split my films up into great, good, and um, then okay and bad. Oh, so like a rating system. Yeah, and right now, my, my great films go from La La Land down to Die Hard. My good films are Sicario down to Ocean's Eleven. My okay films are Ant-Man down to Rogue One. And then rather controversially, my bad films are The Force Awakens down to Fifty Shades of Grey, but I also made it even better, because then I was like, hmm, what if I split this up further uh, and and divided things up into ratings out of ten? So this is the official rating out of ten. Fifty Shades Darker and Fifty Shades of Grey are my two one out of tens. Jurassic World and Daddy's Home 2 are my two two out of tens. Um, you have Jurassic World my... two out of ten. Yeah, I hate Fucking it. Hell. My threes, threes are The Force Awakens and Tomb Raider. Uh, oh, sorry, down to Tomb Raider. There's also Dunkirk and The Last Jedi there. Wow, three my... out of ten? Yes. Okay, you don't get ratings, do you? My fours are Ocean's Twelve and Rogue One. And then my fives are Ant-Man, Daddy's Home, Hell or High Water, which I, we still haven't reviewed, even though I've still got it on there. Um, Age of Ultron and Captain America. Uh, and then my sixes are Avengers, Ocean's 13, Minority Report, and Ocean's 11. My sevens are Sicario, Thor Ragnarok, and Zootopia. Oh, that's a spoiler, actually, because that is an indication that Zootopia has moved. Um, and then my, my eights are Die Hard, uh, Deadpool, Manchester by the Sea. Yeah, okay. I don't want to reveal too much, Luke, because, you know, some of these are secret. Uh, and then, my nines, I don't have any tens. Neither do I. I was thinking about it, Luke. And my top film, I would not give a ten. Anyway, no, so basically, Luke, what I'm saying is, do you want to actually, I'll tell you how my rating actually works. I do have a logic to my rating, which is, a four out of ten is a film that is bad, but is still worth a watch. A three out of ten is a film that is bad, but isn't worth a watch. There you go. That's my difference between a four out of ten and a three out of ten. Uh, a five out of ten is just average. I can't believe you gave Jurassic World two out of ten. <laughs> That's because it's, it's bad, and uh, I hate it. Well, you... I think the rules are, so uh, so 3 out of 10 is bad and not worth a watch. 2 out of 10 is, is bad, and I actively am angry at his, its existence. Uh, and then a 1 out of 10 is bad, and I think if you force me to watch it again, I would probably uh, just, just spiral into depression and kill myself. Okay. So that's, that's my ratings. Well, good stuff. Um, <laughs> and 6 out of 10. 6 out of 10 is great. Right. Yeah, anything, honey. Anything above a six, that's fantastic. Anyway, kind of pointless, Luke, but just I did it. And because I did it, I had to talk about it. Fair enough. Uh, so there we go. We have been selecting and reflecting on Die Hard because of the 30-year anniversary of its release. 
Thank you for listening. Uh, who have you been, Michael? I have been Michael. And I have been Luke. And join us next week when we'll be going from the greatest Christmas and or action movie of I all time. don't know what we're doing. We are to doing... Mamma Mia. Ah! You know what, Luke? I mean, to be honest, okay. So, like I say, I'm going through a lot of the films that we watched in the first half. A lot of the films we watched in the first half, especially right at the beginning, are kind of like very uh, highbrow, yeah. intelligent films. Uh, and like I've been watching them, it's kind of just been hurting my brain. So <laughs> I'm kind of looking forward to Mamma Mia. Nice little break. Yeah, that's like I felt that way about Di- like I watched um, I watched Manchester by the Sea, <laughs> and then immediately after that I watched Die Hard, and I was just like, okay, that's. It's better now. <laughs> just, just turn your brain off. Just watch it. Yeah, yeah. that's that's Good. the thing. Like we have all the Oscar movies, like just at the beginning of the year. So you yeah, have, and then yeah. Uh, like it's fine. actually no, Luke. I am gonna ask, tell you this now. Okay, guess. I could say I'm, I'm gonna frame this as a guess, all those kind of points. Right. So guess what percentage of my um, top ten films are films we reviewed in our first thirteen episodes? What percentage? Yes, 80. or or out ninety. Oh. There, there is only one film that uh, is not in is, that was in my top ten that wasn't one we reviewed in the first thirteen episodes, and that was Deadpool. Oh, that is fascinating, Michael. That is fascinating. So that's that. that it kind of it does give an indication of how. Um, like part of me was thinking like, oh, maybe I was just you know nicer back then. But no, genuinely, genuinely, the films we watched have just. I mean, yeah, there are some exceptions like Die Hard. Yeah. Which has just taken the number ten spot, actually. Right. So that's why it's, it doesn't apply anymore. But uh, but that, yeah, often it's like that. Oh, it's a good bit. I mean, just looking at look at all this Marvel. You know, so much. When we've Marvel been doing this, Souls. like obviously each year we rack up a list of like the fifty-two movies we review or like fifty-five. Yeah. If we review two in one week, because obviously sometimes we do that. And then like after ten years of doing this, we'll just put them all together and we'll have a list of like five hundred and like fifty movies. All yeah, right. at some point we're going to have to review like some of the films that we actually think are ten out of tens. Yeah, but I because I don't see us, we may we may never review either of our favorite films. No, we will. There is a very okay, we were, American well. Beauty came out in ninety nine and won the Oscar in two thousand. So oh, no, you know what? I bet a serious man. We're not going to be able to. Well, well whatever. It doesn't matter. Anyway, <laughs> yes. So yeah, we'll do. Okay. Um, we'll just say bye then, and uh, see you next week for Mamma Mia. Goodbye. Hasta luego.